Next, we're going to look at how the Hebbian mechanisms that we looked at for self-organizing might apply to a different kind of learning problem where we are specifying the overall behavior of the network. We're trying to get the network to do a particular kind of behavior. And the simplest way to think about this is in terms of an input output mapping, some kind of pattern associator is what we typically call it in the in the literature. In this particular model, you can see there's an input layer of four units, an output layer with two units, and we're just gonna learn different patterns across these different layers. So if we look at our first example, this is the easy pattern. Input on the left means activate the corresponding output unit on the left, the next unit over, etc. And it's basically, you can think of this as learning to categorize these inputs in terms of whether they're more on the left or more on the right. We can uh, set the model to train. We can step through each individual training trial. So here's one of the examples uh, with an input on the left, this first pattern. Now we see the next one, the next one, and so on. And on each trial, the network is using in this initial configuration heavy in learning to develop a learned association between the input and the output. And so if we click on the RD weight, we can see that the weight change is going up for those two connected units. And that's because they're both active at the same time. The heavy in principle, two neurons that fire together, wire together that creates an increased strength of association. So in this model, we're testing after each complete iteration or epoch is the, t the official term of all of the individual items in that training set. So essentially the epoch is four items. And after we step through each uh, item there, you see this quick flash and that is when the network is going back through and testing how it's performing across each of those different items. And meanwhile, while training the network, we're essentially clamping or driving both the input and the output to be in the desired pattern of activity. And when you're doing that, it's hard to tell, you know, essentially to, to see whether the network has gotten it right. To do that, you need to give it this kind of testing mode where you only present the inputs and then see how it responds to the outputs. And so we can actually go through and run that test separately. If I hit this test trial button, now we're seeing how the network is responding individually to each one. So you can see it got this one right. That's the correct answer for this. And again, we're not clamping this. This is actually what it's learned in response. This one you can see is clearly wrong. This is not the right output mapping for this particular input. This one it got right and the last one I got right. So it's got one out of the four problems wrong. You can also look at a plot of the overall uh, accuracy of the network, um, looking at what percent it's getting right versus wrong. This is shown in this line here, as, uh, which is updated as the network trains. And this is using the sum squared error measure, which is just the sum of the difference between what the activity on that unit is minus what it should have been. And you can actually see the target activity by clicking on this targ value. That tells you what the right answer was unbeknownst to the network in this testing case. Um, and then you just subtract the actual activation minus that target. You square that so that it's always a positive number and you just kind of sum that up. And what we do that's a little bit different from standard models is we threshold the error term. So if it's on the right side of 0.5, then we count it as 100% correct because we don't really care about getting like all the exact level of activity for a particular target value. So in other words, if the target is one and the activity is above 0.5, that counts as 100% correct. Likewise, if the target is zero and it's below, below 0.5, then that also counts correct there. We can kind of click on this step epoch uh, button and that takes us through each of the all four of the training items and runs this test and tells us how the network is responding and you can see that it's getting 
100% uh, correct now after just a few epochs of training. And after it does gets that correct for a few epochs in a row, it starts over. And now we have a new set of random weights. So now the network is starting afresh with new random weights. And we can see that it is able to learn this problem really quickly. And that's because essentially, as we saw in the label, this is an easy problem. Why is that? Well, it's because the weight structure for a learned solution essentially involves just you know increasing the synaptic weights for the input units and the output units that were active at the same time and this is in in fact exactly what Hebbian learning is designed to do it's it's essentially telling us that the correlational structure the statistical structure of the inputs and outputs is directly related to the answer that you're supposed to get. And so this is an example of a, a, a behavioral problem that can be solved with those correlations. But if you think about the larger space of problems in the real world, that's not really always true. Like uh, many words have multiple meanings in the English language, bank and bank. Um, they have two different meanings, one being a riverbank, the other being a place where you put your money. There's not really much correlational association between those words. Um, and that's true of many, many different things. There's another example is object recognition. Uh, recognizing objects is notoriously difficult. One of the things that it took a long time for neural networks to learn to do. Um, and it's because any of these simple correlational, associational kind of learning mechanisms don't really align with what you need to do in that task. And I can explain that later in chapter six. So let's look at a pattern of problems that's actually not so easily aligned with the correlational structure. And these are the hard problems that we're going to be looking at. And here um, we again have four different input patterns. All of those four patterns have the same input unit active. And in fact, this last item here, this event number three, has these kind of two central units, so to speak, um, that are active across many of these different patterns. Um, and it needs to be associated with this right output response, whereas those same two units are active correlationally. They're correlated with um, the output over here. So this is a hard problem because the correlations in the input do not line up with the overall solution. So I can go over here, hit hard, go to init, and now I can see how the network does on this particular problem. So again, we can step through the training. Again, we're presenting the input, we're presenting the output directly, we're clamping the output and we're just doing this simple Hebbian learning on each as we go through the problem. And if we train the network, we see that despite many efforts to learn it over many repeated epochs of training and different initial random weights, it never learns the problem. So this is the problem with Hebbian learning. It's incapable in general, in the general case, of learning problems, especially those problems that don't align with the core, where the correlational structure does not align with the solution.